Paprika Girl, Ricky Okanda. And today you're in Fukushima, right, Ricky? That's right. Today I'm in Aizu Wakamatsu. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining. Usually you are in Tokyo. Yeah, and usually I'm over in Kichijoji. And you are working as a film director for many years. You are a writer. You are an inspiration for all of us trying to follow traditional Japanese things. You are a lover of kimono, even in your daily life. You have a gorgeous kimono on right now, which I'm looking forward to you telling us about. Originally, <laughs> you came over from Chicago. Is that right? That's right. Um, I've been here almost 18 years now. Wonderful. And I just want to introduce your website if people want to find their way over to your Wixi. Let me see if I can do this. <laughs> Share the page here. So you I have your wonderful Twitter, of course. You have your Instagram, but you also have this uh, website where you introduce some of your tweets and ideas of which we're talking about today, like summer kimono and other ideas that you always introduce. And even though I followed you for a long time, I'm always amazed by how many new things I always learn. You always, <laughs> you always find new things. Even though we're talking about traditional things, you always find new things. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. There's just so much to do here and so much to learn. So you never get tired of, you know, in Japan, you're always uncovering new little tidbits of information and history and culture. You never get bored. That's wonderful. I think for, for new audience, people who haven't heard your story before, because you have graced us with your presence in the talk show series many times. Um, originally, you got interested in kimono when your husband's mother kind of gave you some of her beautiful kimono and started introducing you to that and through tea ceremony. Is that right? Um, it's actually my husband's grandmother. Um, she was a geisha over in Kagurazaka um, way, way a long time ago. Um, unfortunately, she recently passed away at the age of 98. But uh, it was her who initially kind of adopted me even before we were married um, as, oh, this person has um, the potential to wear. But <laughs> she thought maybe I'd be interested in wearing the kimono. And so she would send me a package at least once a month of kimono for the morning, kimono for the evening, and the, it was the colors and the styles and the flowers and the designs that are appropriate for that particular month. And it changed every single time. So that was what fascinated me initially because I didn't realize that there were so, so many differences in, in the way that the life and uh, in the way that people live from month to month. And so that kind of opened up the box. And then suddenly you realize, well, everything is seasonal in Japan. And then you realize tea is an uh, exceptional part of the base of why everything is seasonal in Japan. It just gets bigger and bigger all the time. Yeah, wonderful. Um, can you describe your kimono that you're wearing today? Oh, um, this is a cotton. Uh, it was, it's not, this is not an Aizu cotton, although I would have liked to get an Aizu cotton for today. I, I found the fabric. I haven't made the kimono yet, but um, this one is made over in Kyoto. It's uh, kind of unique because I don't know if you can tell, but the um, the fabric beneath it is patterned. It's full. Of, even the um, there is a kind of a, a embroidery of a pattern in the basic fabric, and then on top of that is a print of seasonal flowers. So uh, it's one of those things which is in between a kimono and yukata. So you can wear it with or without an eddy collar. And um, this is a standard. We have a hakata over here. And I've tied it in a um, koken musubi style, like this. I don't know if you can see it. Here we go. This is a koken musubi. Beep, 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 beep. And uh, Koken Musubi was more popular during the 1970s. I don't know if you've seen the movie Lady Snowblood, but um, uh, Shirayuki Hime, um, she uh, was wearing the Koken Musubi everywhere she went. It's kind of like a strong, almost manly way to tie the, the obi, but still yet ladylike enough to be elegant. Yeah, very dramatic. It has like a, 
a flair to it. I love it. <laughs> um, the, I think the image of kimono is that most kimono is silk, but you always introduce a variety of different materials, especially for summer. Is it more often maybe a linen type or cotton or lighter materials? Is that right? Well, there's a, there's a linen and there's cotton. Um, there's the dough, which is kind of like a gauze fabric. There is sha, which is a lighter weave. Um, some of them, it all depends on the way that you weave the fabric together. So they kind of interleave the, um, uh, so you could get a much tighter weave, for example, which is uh, more uh, convenient for something earlier in the spring or late in the after or late in the uh, autumn. But what really makes a kimono different for the season is the way that is how tight you're, you're weaving the fabric. And if, once you get, get to the wet, the winter kind of a stage, you have double layer fabric, so the air doesn't get through. Whereas in, in the summer, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it's almost like you're um, wearing lace. So the air just goes right through it. So it's it's much it's actually um, much cooler than something like jeans or a t-shirt would be. Wow. And you've really gotten accustomed to the style of wearing kimono. Uh, we've talked <laughs> to a few people in the series who not only went to kimono school, but they spent many years learning how to wear. How did you learn? Did you go to school? Did you study just on your own? Oh, it's uh, mostly grandmother. So um, when I went to grandmother's place, I would wear the kimono that she gave me because, you know, it's etiquette to do so. You wear the sweater that grandma gives you over the, over the winter, right? Well, you wear the kimono that grandma gives you. And I go there and she'll fix it and she'll be like, oh, if you tie it like this, it's, it's a little bit more, it's a little more casual. It looks like you know what you're doing. Or, you, oh, you could be nice, much looser with your eddy and your collar over here. Don't be so tight about it. And she would teach me all the things that uh, made the kimono attractive because she was a geisha. So the way that she would wear them is slightly, it's not the usual thing you'd learn over in a kimono school where it'd be tight and formal because, oh goodness, it's kind of opening up a box here. <laughs> um, people who go to kimono school, they're usually learning how to wear them formally. The reason is, is that they're not as common as they used to be. And the only times when people tend to wear kimono is during for relatively formal occasions. So you'll have a tea ceremony or you'll have um, someone's graduation or a wedding or something like that. They won't teach you how to wear kimono casually, not usually. Um, whereas my grandmother, she, or my grandmother-in-law, she taught me how to wear them um, as if I were wearing them every day. So that way it's a little bit easier. It's less formal, it's less tight. It's a lot looser and frankly, the way that she wore them especially, it's a little sexier. So she would, um, if you would lower the, the back of, this is called an eddy, but you lower the nape of your kimono a little bit and just to do it at the right degree kind of makes just, it's like the same thing as showing a little bit of cleavage, you know, just naughty enough to be interesting, right? Without being of course uh, dirty, you know, um, naughty or trashy in any way. But these are the sorts of things that uh, I learned from someone you know, who's 98 years old, who wore kimono every single day of her life since she was born. So, um, I don't know, it, it made it very comfortable for me. I have no, there's nothing itches. It doesn't feel like heavy or tight or constrictive the way that some people assume kimonos are going to be. And one of the things that you also introduced in a previous episode is about if you are given a kimono that's not exactly the right size for you, you can take it to a shop and they can make it longer or wider or whatever you need. Um, that that's another service you can have done at a kimono shop. Yeah. That's right. Interestingly enough, kimono, when they're sewn, they don't tend to, you don't cut a kimono, uh, especially for the sleeves and places like that. What you do is you fold it under, you fold it and sew it. And the reason for this is kimonos were passed down to other people and to other generations. That's what they were intended to do. So what you can do is take the kimono, if you find something you really like, you bring it over to a kimono shop and just have everything. It's called it's um, an arai hari, where they take out all the stitches from the kimono and then they'll turn it back to the original base of the pieces and then re-stitch it to fit the person who is going to be using it from now on. And it's amazing that kimono, they can last for hundreds of years. Seriously, I have a kimono which was belonged to um, great 
grandmother. So this was during the Meiji period when this kimono was made, it's actually a summer one. I should have sent it to you, I'll send it to you later, but um, it's a dark green kimono that I thought was just beautiful. And then I turned it in to get fixed because it was just so small. It was like a little tiny thing. It was like wearing teeny teeny little sleeves like this. And I just really wanted to use it. So I turned it into a kimono shop. I said, well, I want to get this fixed. And they looked at me and they said, this is, this kimono is 150 years old. <laughs> and they want, of course, they wanted to show it in the museum for a short period of time, which they did. And they gave me a discount on the, on the resewing. It's very nice. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's amazing how long these things can last as long as they're used and continuously used properly. Beautiful. Um, can you describe some of the other kimono that I'm showing on screen? I think this was last year. You were doing kind of a modeling project with a watch designer. Is that right? And then you got gifted a watch afterwards and such gorgeous photos. <laughs> well, um, these are all taken in my tea room. These are all at my house. Um, the ones the top and the bottom one my friend actually it's a little bit a little bit more casual it wasn't an official model or anything like that but um, my friend is a photographer and he wanted to have something for his portfolio in order to pitch to a watchmaker and so he asked me would you um, be willing to wear a kimono and put a watch on and, and and i was very happy to do so i still use that beautiful watch over there um it's from august bird by the way <laughs> but um yeah just uh all these kimono that I'm wearing in all of the pictures, these all belong to my grandmother. So um, even though she was a smaller person than me, I had all of them fixed. So they all fit me quite well. Um, they're 1960s, 1950s designs. So uh, I can't, you know, they've lasted a long time. Uh, these ones here that I'm wearing, this is a doe kimono. So this is for late summer. So it's probably taken during August. Um, the other ones that you showed up there, you had a, I think it was a blue one and then a dark purple. Those are both the Tsumugi kimono. Um, they're also our uh, early summer. There we go. This one over here. This is an early summer kimono as well as the blue one. Um, they're only one layer. And that's the difference between an early summer and then a midsummer, which is uh, kind of lacy, kind of empty kind of looking. But the... Uh, these kind of kimonos, you could wear them anything from um, somewhere like a, if it's kind of hot, even late April up to uh, early, uh, I don't know, up to um, mid May and June, I'm sorry, mid June. And um, why these are so convenient kimonos is these are the genes of kimonos. So, for example, if you wanted to go out shopping, like this one over here, I put a sticker on my face because, you know, I was completely drunk out of my mind. <laughs> but, but this is a, a tsumogi. And a tsumugi is good for going out shopping or going to, if it's raining outside, this is the kimono that it's okay to get a little bit dirty and get splashed with water. It's the kimono that it's okay to run around trains in or, um, or hike up a mountain. I don't know what hike up a mountain, but you know, if you got one of those temples to go to, this is the kimono you'd wear. Or if you're going drinking a night out on the town and you kind of want to look classy wearing a kimono, you wear a tsumugi because it makes you look like you know what you're doing, right? Um, this kimono over here with the green obi that I'm wearing, that one is a mixture of silk and cotton. It's um, kind of unique because you have this kind of a blend. Um, it's called a yuki tsumugi. That's what it is. A tsumugi, by the way, it's, just, it's another way to say it's a certain weave of silk. So um, this is a yuki tsumugi. Yuki tsumugi is from up north over in, uh, you have it anywhere from from, you have the Fukushima kind of area all the way up to uh, Tochigi in there. You have, uh, um, anyway, it's, it's Tohoku in Japan where the Yuki Tsumugi is where it's coming from. But um, the Yuki Tsumugi is nice because you're blending two different kinds of materials. You have one in the back and one in the front, and you just get glimpses of one or the other. So depending on the angle that you're looking at the Tsumugi, it kind of changes color. So you can kind of see in the photograph that, that you'll have like a little bit of a glint of yellow on the side of my arms or on certain folds of the fabric. It's because the green and the blue and the, I'm sorry, the blue and the yellow, they're kind of blending into each other in order to create that kind of a light green for spring. That is absolutely gorgeous. I love that translucency of color. Mm -hmm. And this, this lighter material here, the smugi that I'm showing, mm -hmm. I'll bring it to the main screen. Ah, it's, also, 
Is that a linen linen type? It looks nice and light. Actually, this is also it's this is also a um, tsumagibi. This is from. Um, I'm trying to figure out where it's from. I don't remember where it's from. Um, but oh goodness, I'm trying to remember where it's from. I can't remember the name of it. But this is actually um, it's kind of like wearing. Ooh, I'm sorry, my computer just did something funny. Wait, why is it doing this? Uh, are you I'm back? Sorry. Can you see? Hold on. Can you see me? I can see you. I can I, hear you. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Are you okay? Okay. Yes. Um, computers. Ah. Hold on. <laughs> My sisters. I don't know why. Somebody. Hold on a second. Hacking in. I hope not. Mo no. We'll be back. Back I momentarily. Know. I can't. Oh goodness! I pressed something on my on my little headphone thingy, and then the music popped up and it went boom. And I was listening to you too while I was watching you. Oh, are you are you back now? Are you okay? I am now. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> So we're, we're talking about uh, this lighter fabric. I think you had these two photos together in your Twitter feed. This is the same computer. This is the same uh, kimono. Okay. It looks like I little just... uh, Space Invaders design on it, like very, <laughs> very video game-esque. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, that's the fun part about Tsumugi is that instead of getting just one color or one kind of a print, you're going to get a weave, which from a distance, it'll look less complicated than something when you're looking at um, close up, which is another fun reason why you want to wear this to the uh, to the bar or something like that, because you're standing next to someone and you're, you know, you're, you're with um, somebody interesting and you're kind of closing up on them. They kind of look at your kimono and if they mention, oh, what a lovely weave you have over there. What a nice kimono. Look at all the colors. And it's kind of like hey, something to flirt about. So it's another fun reason to wear kimono, which are made of tsumaki. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, now, speaking of uh, wearing kimono, of course, hairstyle is also, it's nice to have like a more traditional style hair design or, and uh, I saw that you went to a salon. So for special occasions, um, would you go to a salon and get it done? And then for every day you would do it yourself? Is that right? It depends on how lazy I am. <laughs> um, Let's see. Well, if I have something nice going on, um, like I'll go to a tea ceremony or something like that, I can't quite see what's going on in the back all the time. So I'll go to a salon. There are a whole bunch of them in uh, in uh, Kichijoju where I live. This is called a yakai maki. And a yakai maki is simply, it's a night twist. It's what they, it's quite, uh, it's what they're translated as. Well, they just put your, your hair all the way up and in and they'll fold it in. It's very simple. It takes only something like 10, 15 minutes. If you have little, um, like a kanzashi or a little, those, those pretty little twinkly things, you can stick them in there real easily. Um, it's also mostly done without putting in any extra padding. So it's very light and uh, lets the breeze in very quickly, easily. Um, you can wear any kind of hair that you want with a kimono, really. I mean, I wear this particular style because it suits my age and what I do. And um, how I move around. I don't want the hair frizzing everywhere. Um, and you never know, I could be going from, one, I'll go over to the palace one day or I'll go to um, shopping the next day. I don't want to have something which is very uh, location and event specific. Whereas like, you know, you can have hair which is like swept off to the side with a lovely ponytail or you could put little curly, curly things if you want or you could have blue hair if you want to or Anything you want, everything goes with kimono. It looks just fine either way. That's wonderful. I love to hear that versatility of kimono now because I think that puts a lot of people off that they think, oh, you have to wear it only a certain way. I don't know how to wear it like that, so I'm not going to wear it. You know, if there's a low entry into wearing kimono, it's much, much less intimidating, right? I do think so. Um, kimono, I mean, it, it, this was something that people wore every single day of their lives for more than a thousand years. So if it were something that were very location and event specific, then um, it would be practical for everyone on a daily basis, right? 
And so, yes, it's true, there are formal kimono, and unfortunately, um, it tends to be the case that people are being taught the formal way of wearing the kimono. So it is complicated, but this is something that you put on in four minutes just before you're going online to have an interview um, with JJ, right? <laughs> this is something that has to be really quick and really fast, and essentially it is. So yes, they'll teach you the very complicated, and it has to be in this particular form, but think of it sort of like a suit. Right, so a suit has lots of pieces, especially a double-breasted one, right? So a suit has lots of pieces, and uh, if you want to look all fancy and formal, you know, you have your top hat, your top hat, and your um, tie and tails and whatever you call it, I forgot it. But um, you have all these things that you could do to make it fancy, so they teach you the fancy stuff first. Whereas in um, to everyday life, do people wear that kind of stuff? Not necessarily, no. What they'll do is they have their pair of jeans and they'll throw on a jacket, maybe a tie if they have a really casual, you know, they'll do that for an everyday meeting. That's the same thing that you might not do. So it starts out looking all complicated and stuff, but the truth is, is that you're wearing something that you can wear every single day and you can do um, very quickly as long as you learn how to do it, right? So it's just a matter of just doing it every single day and wearing kimono constantly, you'll realize that it's a lot easier than it looks and it's a lot more practical than it looks. That's wonderful. And uh, you talked about going to a kimono shop and looking at fabric to get your husband a new summer kimono. Um, but also you went to like a discount kimono shop and found a real bargain. So uh, it's not cost prohibitive to find some nice kimono, right? No, it's not. Um, especially now you'll go to it. There's all sorts of little tenji kind. There's um, depends on where you are. But if you look for furugi kimono and uh, in your area, you're going to find all these shops which are selling kimonos, which are secondhand ones. And you, it's a good idea to start there. I mean, all my kimono are mostly secondhand because I got them from grandmother, right? But um, you can get, you can find something really, really cheap that you can get some for, uh, kimono for like 10 bucks. And of course you need uh, all the underwears and stuff like that because you know, um, you know, you wear a different kind of underwear underneath your dress that you would wear underneath the kimono, of course. So you have to buy those yourself separately and you're not gonna find them at a furugi and you don't want anyone's old underpants. But you can get the kimono itself for 10 bucks, 20 bucks. You can get an obi for 10 bucks, 20 bucks. So if you have $50 and you, and you really want a kimono, yes, you can go and go find a furugi and go find kimono and find something that you like and start from there. And then little by little, you'll branch out and you realize, oh, well, I kind of like this fabric or, oh, maybe I want something a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler. Um, there are all these variations in kimono, but you have to give yourself a starting point for a branch out from. And yes, you can, um, it's kind of depends on how how deep, yeah, this one over here, you got a picture of that, a whole bunch of the uh, right, I think it's the right bottom, this one, that's right. Uh, that's a furugi kimono, and you can get them from anywhere. You can get them for like 100 yen all the way. You can get them up to go 100 yen or something. It depends on the level and the quality and all these other things of the kimono that you're buying. But in those little boxes there, you'll find all the little ties and stuff like that. You get them for 500 yen. Um, I remember... Uh, this particular photograph I took, maybe it was two weeks ago. So my husband and I were going to a tea ceremony. And initially it was me who was going to the tea ceremony, but um, he's an interesting person. He's a historian. So uh, my tea master suddenly decided that he wanted to have an historian and he wanted to have him as a shokyaku, which means it's an important person in the tea room. And to show that he would talk a lot. That's the whole point of him being a shokyaku, right? So um, I had to get him a proper hakama. Because you don't wear a hakama that often unless you're doing tea, which you have to wear one. And so I had to run over to the furugi really quickly because to get a hakama. And I found when it was only 2,000 yen, it was a very nice long um, one with the formal stripes and everything. But then um, it was also a it's, a, it's a spring and autumn hakama. And so when he went to the tea ceremony, he was so impressed that he wanted to continue. But if he wears a spring hakama from now on, it's going to be hot. So I have to get him made him one for summer. And seriously, hakama are just for tea people. So they're not that common over at the Furugi. So I went to an, a, uh, the local kimono shop where I usually get mine fixed because I had to order one special for him uh, from now on. Because he says he's going to be serious about studying tea. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and get him a nice kimono for it. Wow, that's great. You have a, a culture in common now, a common so. hobby. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, that's, that's part of his heritage because it's his grandmother who has 
been your mentor in terms of getting into kimono. That's lovely. Yeah. It really is. It's nice. And then he's happy because he'll occasionally find a photograph of grandmother over at the Jika and it'll be, she'll be wearing one of the kimonos that she's patched on to me. So um, it, it feels nice to be able to like bring, you know, continue that kind of, uh, you know, the heritage, like you said, the, like heritage of the family, like this one too. This is an interesting kimono, this one. Um, this is, uh, it has an umegara. So this is, oh no, my computer's doing the movie again. Oh, wait, no, I'm not gonna let it happen. Hold on, quit, there we go. Ha, this might've worked. No, please work. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so this particular kimono um, is, has a plum pattern. And a plum pattern kimono is somewhat rare because uh, it's usually only worn in January and February of uh, it, during a one year period. And there was a time, one of the things that my grandmother uh, taught me was that since she was a geisha, she taught me certain dances. And umewa saitaka is a very, very popular dance um, for the early part of the year. Um, umewa saitaka means have the uh, the plum blossoms have uh, have uh, blossomed. The plums have blossomed. Are the when are the sakura going to blossom? That's the key phrase of the of the, uh, the dance. And so I went to go visit grandmother. Um, this is during the later years of her life, and she had somewhat kind of forgotten things. So she didn't even remember my husband's name. She remembered his face, and she could remember um, her daughter's face, but she couldn't remember their names. And so she was very nice and very polite and saying, oh, it's very nice to see you. What's your name again? And she would be at that kind of a level. And she's very adorable, though, but very polite. But, um, you know, she didn't remember anything. But um, I performed the dance, Umewa Saitaka, for her because she had taught it to me many years ago. And it was then that she, just as I began to dance, she started to sing. And this is unique because she had never sung Umewa Saitaka before or she never sung in general before, not before her grandchild and not before her own daughter. And her her daughter, which was my husband's mother, was so impressed by hearing her own mother sing. She started to cry and it was quite an emotional moment. And um, when we returned home, uh, my mother-in-law presented me with this kimono that I'm wearing in this picture here. And this kimono was worn by grandmother to perform Umewa Saitaka when she was a young geisha. This is a very old kimono. This is maybe 70 years old or so, but um, it, it had a lot of emotional value to uh, mother-in-law. So to be able to be given this, was it really meant a lot to me. It really did. Wow, beautiful. What a wonderful story too. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So this is this is silk made of silk. Yep, this is silk. This is a winter kimono, so um, it has three layers inside of there. We have the top layer, which is the uh, which is the whole mongi part, and then inside we have a buffer layer, and in the middle, in the very um, in the complete on the inside of here, will be you can't see it in the photograph, but there is a a light pink uh, liner material on the inside of it so that when you lift up your sode, you can lift up your sleeve, you can see just a little bit of the pink. It's a hint of the sakura, which are going to be coming soon. That's the whole point of it. I love so that. The, the secret, secret mystery under oh, the yeah. sleeve or at the hem. That's a, another like Easter egg of looking at kimono, right? <laughs> oh yes, when you're making your own kimono, there's all sorts of things you can do. You can there's some beautiful maybe there's some could be some beautiful material which is like slightly damaged on one side and you can't make a kimono out of it, but you really like the material. Well, when you make a winter kimono, you have multiple layers in there too. So you have the, the layer on the outside, but then you can use the damaged material for the inside so that people can just see a little bit of it. Ah, this is another summer kimono um, or early summer kimono. And you can see the other thing that I've done is um, the under uh, the underskirt. It's called the juban, but the underskirt can be anything you want. This particular juban is quite unique because not only am I using an unusual pattern to make it, but this is called a hikashi skirt or azuma skirt, and it doesn't flap open. So, for example, you have the um, 
you have one flap and then you cover it with the other one. And if the wind blows, it goes, whee, you may as well get a little bit of glimpse of ankle there or something like that, you know? Well, hibachi skirt is designed for dancing so that even if you would like kick up your feet really high, you won't get any glimpses of absolutely anything. And it's designed that way. So um, I have this made out of a dark material with Sakura pattern on top of it. Um, you can't buy these pret porte you have to actually get them made. But uh, what's fun about it is you're walking along and the wind will blow a big gust and you'll see just a little bit of the higashi skirt. And since it's such an unusual and interesting pattern, you'll get a lot of really good comments about that. Not too many comments, of course, but the ones who notice and <laughs> they'll be like, oh, I haven't seen something like that before. So that's another fun part of kimono that you won't always see just from a photograph. You have to actually move and live in it in order to experience. I love that. And I love the idea that you can have kind of more covering so you don't have to worry about when you sit down and everything coming out, all your legs and, you know, being indelicate because you're supposed to look elegant, right? Um, so that that's <laughs> better better for dancing. I, I love that. And you have to get it custom made. So go to a kimono shop and ask about it. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And what you can do is you can bring an old kimono that you like. It's just too small. You just want, or you like the fabric or whatever it may be. And just bring it to the kimono and shop and say you want to make a higashi skirt out of it. You want to make a juban out of it. You want to make, um, you want to use it as a lining again underneath this kimono. There's so versatile, the fabric in there. So um, you can use anything you want in order to make it. Are you okay? I'm sorry, I just had to turn off my phone. Okay, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, you always have these wonderful explanations about different seasonal culture and traditions. Can you tell us a little bit about June and some of the things that you like about this time of year? So I'm showing your your poster now, uh, showing the ajisai, ajisai pictures, cucumbers, and wagashi. Can you hold on for just one moment? Sure, sure, sure. I'm going to turn this completely off. Yeah. You're a popular, popular lady. I'm currently in um, the Aizu Wakamatsu because what I'm doing is I'm going to, I'm planning for a film, which I'm going to be filming uh, the, the day after tomorrow. And um, we're doing a lot of checking of the uh, locations around over here. So everybody's moving and they want, they have questions and things like that. And then I say, I'm busy. And of course they call all during this time. Yeah, so like sorry. Works. No, I appreciate you joining us during such a busy time when you're on location. Oh no, it's fun. You know, it's a break from everything. And you know, it's a little bit early too. So in a good way. So good. I've got plenty of time and I shouldn't be getting too many calls, but you know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you made this poster as you usually do. You're a wonderful illustrator. Um, you often do these designs uh, over your face when you're wearing kimono. It's really cute. Um, tell us a little bit about June in Japan. What do you like about this time of year? All right. Well, since we're in June right now, June is right in the middle of the uh, um, CU. So it's the rainy season. The rainy season doesn't mean it's always raining, but you know, it's always going to be humid. It's going to be slightly hot. There's going to be a lot of temperature changes, hot to cold all the time. Um, you're going to have moisture everywhere. And so as a result, I, oh goodness, is my computer doing it again? I'm so sorry. Every time I fix, wait, come on, quit. Every time I fix my, uh, the headphone things, that oh, opens up the music. Right or something like that. Okay, Unless, okay. Anyway. Are you all right now? Anyway, I'm, I should be okay now. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you have a lot of ajisai right now. Ajisai are flowers uh, which thrive on the water. So you have little snails and you'll have a lot of dew drops and a lot of things like that. And so when you're looking for um, sweets or for on fabric patterns and things like that, you'll see a lot of rain themed items. And uh, th that's what I tried to show during in this uh, the June in Japan uh, feature that I always put up on Twitter. And you'll have a lot of Ajisai patterns on the sweets, which is really kind of cute. And then there'll be representations of water. So you have dew drops on everything. Um, let's see, a lot of people, my nails right now are not like this, but last month, 
I think I put, um, I had nails which had little drops of dew on them. I like to have my nails done in certain ways. And uh, yeah, those, those kinds of sweets. That's a very Ajisai kind of uh, design for a uh, wagashi she'll have in tea ceremony. It's all gonna, it's all going to be uh, something which is themed for this particular month. Water is a major theme. So you'll have the dishes that look like that, or you'll have um, the, the tea bowls, which look like that. The tea is going to be lighter than it usually is. Um, let's see. Also, this month, since it is June, people are, this is koromogae. And koromogae is a Japanese word, which means you're, you're changing the style of clothing that you're wearing. So until now, we would have worn something which would have the double layers on it. But now we're going to change it over to something with a single layer or at the very end of this month, like right now, we're going to use something like sha or uh, no, you're going to use a might even lighter material. So the koromo guy is kind of interesting because it's not just the clothing that's changing, but it's also everything inside of the house. So you're putting away all everything that you needed for last season, or you're going to change the types of foods you're going to be eating things like that. You're also going to be worried about bugs. So I can see up on the screen right now, we have those, uh, the incense holders. These are for the round um, incense that they sell over here in Japan. They get rid of mosquitoes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, we don't have a lot of mosquitoes in my area, but my husband is one of those types which will get bitten five seconds after he's out of the door. And so we, he has, um, proclivity, he'll just buy a lot of these anti-mosquito coils all the time. And it's a very nice scent. It's a very summery scent. So it's all right if everything smells like it. But um, we have these things all over the garden. And he insisted of, he likes the little pig because the pig is the traditional one, um, katoribuda. But the, the little, he insisted on buying cats this time. So I come home and there are these little black porcelain cats, which are all over the garden and they all have mosquito coils and he wanted to put them in different positions and see if I could find them. So Easter egg hunt or Easter or kitty, kitty, kitty hunt. So as I was in that's, Kyoto the other. That's so cute. And then you have the, <laughs> the uh, kind of bug off omamori, which is a traditional yeah. lucky charm style. Yes. That's gorgeous. This one I found in Kyoto. So I was in Kyoto just um, a couple, a uh, few days ago, I guess about a week ago. And um, they were selling these over at a paper shop of all things, but uh, Kyoto is famous for incense. So one of the most popular gifts that people who live in Japan, they'll, they'll go to Kyoto, they'll buy incense and they'll, and they'll bring it back. Like, like this one, for example, um, with the box, the purple boxes. But those ones, uh, that's also an incense I bought recently in Kyoto. So at the same location, I also found these little omamori things. And the omamori thing we put on everything. We put on the bags, we put it, you can hang it from your obi if you want to. So this one happens to be made using um, anti-mosquito incense. So I brought this home and Shintaro, or <laughs> my husband, he has it tied to everything in the house right now. He's got one here and he's got one on his bag and he just loves it because he hates mosquitoes so much. <laughs> That's awesome. I also I also noticed you introduced about an incense type of fragrance that you yeah. use in your hair. I, I love yeah. that idea. It's, it's actually, um, this is relatively new. This is not something common or traditional. People do use, they did use to carry around incense. Uh, they'll stick it like inside of those omamori, or they'll stick it inside of our obi. They might tie a little piece of incense into their hair when they're doing their hair. So it's common to use scents on uh, the self anyway. But this is kind of new. This was developed only three or four years ago. I found it over at a no performance of all places. Um, but it's, it's this uh, perfume which is designed to scent, smell like incense. So I bought these two. And the one on the left is a little bit easier to describe. It's, uh, it's byakudan. It's um, uh, the most common form of incense you'll find in Japan. It's kind of temple -y. So it doesn't smell exactly like a temple, but it's in that kind of direction. And if you're not looking for the temple kind of a scent, you want something more um, mature, then I don't know how to describe this one, but that's the blue, the blue, uh, the dark blue on the right. That's a little more um, earthy kind of a scent to it. So that's the one that I'm always putting, I'm putting it inside of my kimonos over here, or I'll put it in my hair and it lasts a long time. And it, you know, what's interesting about Japanese scents is that they don't use a lot of alcohol. And so I've, I've always had a problem with alcohol sprays 
they'll, they'll get into the nose, the eyes, and they'll make my eyes water, and then they're too strong. And then if you're trying to eat something, then you'll have the flavor of the, of the perfume, which is not nice. I don't want that in my food. So, um, but the Japanese scents over here, they don't bother anyone else. They don't bother your eyes. There's, there's very little alcohol or no alcohol in them. So they, you can go to a sushi shop and not have the flavor destroyed by whatever you're wearing. Lovely. Um, yeah, I'm not big on strong perfumes. And I think most people in Japan as well, uh, you don't yeah. often smell people with heavy colognes or strong perfumes. So this kind of light fragrance is, is so lovely, especially in summer as we're going into uh, more sweaty, crowded areas again after we have vaccines. It's nice to think about smelling nice. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> especially in the big so cities, nice. right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you also, speaking of incense, which you often smell at shrines or temples, uh, you went to Kanda, Kanda Myojin Shrine. That's beautiful. And you had some matcha and, and uh, mochi as well. But the shrine itself is really beautiful. Can you tell us about it? Oh, sure. Um, this is a very special shrine for our family. Uh, this is the Kanda Myojin Shrine. Um, in, inside of it, we have uh, an ancestor who is um, uh, Matsudare Teru, who is um, interred there. <laughs> okay, it's kind of complicated. Uh, well, to put a long story short, he was the bad guy a thousand years ago. Um, they buried his head um, nearby that area. Lots of bad stuff happened. They didn't like that lots of bad stuff was happening. Um, so they took his spirit and then they created a new uh, shrine to house that angry spirit of his um, and now he's considered the patron saint of Tokyo. Um, his name is Taira no Masakado and so Taira no Masakado is, uh, is enshrined um, in this location called Kanda Myojin. That's where my name comes from, Okanda family. Um, and uh, it's what we have over here in this particular photograph is the Hondo where people go in there, they, you know, they throw in a coin or two and then they clap and kind of hope that nothing bad happens to them. But in front of it, we have the Chinowa. And Chinowa is a, it's a festival that happens just this year. It, uh, I'm just saying this, just this part time of the year. It uh, is originally from Kyoto. And what you do in the Chinowa, if you see one of these is it protects against sickness of all things. It was supposed to be protective against the plague, honestly speaking, at the time, uh, I don't know when it was, I think it was the 1300s, 1500s, I think. But what you do is you enter into this Chinoa and you turn left and you figure eight it so that you come back around and you, and you enter from the left to go right and then come back through again the final time. And then you go into the Hondo. And by doing this, you're supposedly supposed to protect yourself from the plague. So you'll see these at a lot of Jinja, right? During this time of the year, you can also, I think, I think in Kyoto, you can you can buy little amulets which are shaped like the Chinoa, or um, they also have little events here and there around the town where you can make and make your own Chinoa. So um, use these kinds of reeds in order to in order to um, create a circle, which you put on, which you keep on your person uh, to protect against illness. Wow, that's lovely. I, I haven't seen this kind of all in like a circle of the straw that you go through. So I thought that was so interesting, unique. Um, you it's also had some, some wonderful matcha and daifuku. Yeah. Was that at the yeah. same shrine? Yes, um, kind of Yojin, not all shrines have this. So um, it's a little kind of a plug for my family shrine here, but um, Kanda Yojin has a little, it, What's, what the shrine is famous for, people go there if they want to make a lot of money. So it's apparently, it's very good. Show by Hanjo. It's very good for um, business in general. So we have this little cafe inside of the shrine, which we which is um, called Masumasu. And Masumasu, it is an, onom it's an onomatopoeia kind of, which means more and more. So the increase of bounty, right? And Masu Masu is also the uh, a name. A masu, of course, is also a, another word for the boxes in which you get sake. So you have a lot of sweets which are themed um, in a box, kind of a theme, uh, because it's just yummy and it's cute. And over here in, at this cafe, you have uh, a matcha set. The matcha set is fun because you can mix it yourself. That's why you have the little matcha um, 
the, uh, like a whisk up the top over there, the chesen. So you can mix it yourself. And then over here you have daifuku. And so we also have, um, daifuku is also another dajare because this is all during in um, downtown Tokyo, which is Edo. And um, Edo, they just love these oyaji gag and dajare and as they say in English, daddy jokes. So lots of daddy jokes uh, involved in everything too. Daifuku is also um, daifuku, um, dai, uh, daifukuchi. So we have all these uh, sweets which are themed after the local gods and local um, spirits and things like this. And the, um, daifuku is supposed to make you especially, especially lucky in business. So by having um, some matcha with a little bit of daifuku and adding a little bit of gold on top of there, it's supposed to make you fruitful and um, uh, successful. <laughs> It's yummy, but too. That makes sense. That's why I was wondering why it had the gold on top. So daifuku, for anybody listening from abroad, means big luck, basically, yes. like really, really lucky. And this is a kind of mochi sweet. And inside, I would assume, would be sweet azuki bean. Is that right? The On the right-hand side, we have one sweet azuki beans. And on the left-hand side, we have ones with um, I don't know, kokuto. So it's the, uh, the, dark, uh, the black sugar sweet. So yeah, we do nice. that sort of thing. Yeah, so lovely. I also, I noticed you, because you do tea ceremony, there's so many wonderful sweets that you know about and you explore and you know all the best makers. Uh, you introduced also Mizu Manju. Is that more yeah. popular during summer? Oh yeah, it's in, the, it's in the grocery stores these days. You can get them anywhere. Uh, these are um, kante. So there's, it's kind of like a, Jelly on jello on the outside, but it's it's hard enough so that you can pick it up. It's just clear. Not on the inside. You have the regular uh, azuki bean mochi on the very on the very in the middle, but on the ones on the right hand side and the left hand side, they're green, right? This is um, this is the same kind of a paste, but except it's made with plum ume. And so, if you know uh, the ume over in here in Japan, it's just a little sour, just in the right way. So it's kind of um, eating like. Um, something sour and refreshing. And the azuki in the middle, it's a koshian, uh, it's a light koshian. So it's not one of those heavy, rich kind of sweets. It's like a pop in your mouth and it kind of melts away. It's very uh, ideal for this kind of a weather. It doesn't make you feel heavy. Wow, and it's so pretty and it looks refreshing because it's kind of a water, a water type of look. And one of the things I love about wagashi is usually it's vegan, usually it's gluten-free. So it's something that's very easy to recommend to visitors or, or people who are trying to look for it. Because, it, you know, most in Japan, it's not easy to be gluten free or vegan. But if you can find traditional sweets, usually they, they are made traditionally a little bit more healthy, a bit less sugar. Is that right? That's true. There's a lot less sugar than the average cake. Uh, the old fashioned traditional ones, they do have a lot of sugar. The reason is for preservation. But the ones that you have today, like the sweets that you have in, on this picture, there's very little sugar in that. Um, and also they're very, they're, of course, they're domestically made because they're namamono, they have to be. Um, they're made on the morning before, before you buy them. So they're very, very fresh. And uh, also what, what's fun about it is that, like, it's, it's, like we said this entire time, it's very seasonal. So you're gonna get them for what, three weeks during the year and that's it. So if you see that, for particular sweet over there, you have to snap it up. <laughs> it's not too expensive usually. And if you can keep on trying new things, you never get bored of them. Yeah, that's lovely. And also connected to tea ceremony, uh, you introduced about stationery always. Uh, stationery and design, you have this beautiful Ajisai stationery. Uh -huh. And you were talking about Chaji, the tea event mm. invitation. Can you talk about that a little bit? I found that so interesting. Oh, um, well, let's see. Part of the one element of tea is, of course, everything seasonal. So the, the material, of course, the, that you're using is going to be uh, ideally in seasonal. But um, when you go to a chaji, and chaji, there's chakai and there's chaji. And chakai is the average we have a tea and sweet. But a chaji is a little bit more formal. So you have not only the tea and sweet, but you have an entire meal there. And it's you're kneeling there for a good hour and a half and it's, you know, you don't feel feet after that, but it's fun because the utensils and the items that come out are very, very high quality. So we're talking museum level quality. So we'll be using a bowl, which was um, owned by Kapugawa Yasu or something like that. It's really, it's worth it, you know, 
but as a result, you have to, you get an invitation. First, you get a call from your team master saying, hey, you open, you want to come? And then assuming that you're going to be there, they're going to write in their own handwriting a very beautiful invitation letter. And um, a lot of these Japanese letters, they're kind of structured very, they're, they're structured very tightly. So you'll have the, um, the greeting, you'll have the seasonal greeting, and you're going to have the um, a re repetition of the invitation and a thank you for the invitation. And then to tell you what date and what time, and I promise I'm going to be there. Then you apologize for not um, uh, coming to meet them in person to say that you're going to be coming there. And then you say thank you very much, and then you, then you write their name. So uh, when I was doing, when I was first beginning to write the Chaji in the uh, responses, um, one thing that I noticed that was that online, they really don't have any examples of them. I mean, I've, written, I've researched a lot of it for it and then I've searched a lot for them, but it's kind of hard to figure out what part of what we need to use. So that's why I decided, well, I took a photograph. This is from last uh, autumn, I think, but um, I took a photograph of the one that I wrote. And so um, you'll see the structure is very uh, defined in there, which is, it seems like it, it's tight and, and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, atsukurushi, as they say in Japanese. Um, it seems like it's very, very formalized, but the, here's the fun part of having it being formalized is that you don't really have to think, think about it. You just have to answer, and you already know what you're going to be saying anyway. So um, it, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. So even though it seems complicated, once you understand the format, yeah. um, it's kind of easier to follow. That's great that you gave oh, that, yeah. so that example. Um, I, I love your handwriting. I think it's beautiful. But <laughs> you say that sometimes you go to like a stationary shop if you have a gift envelope that you want um, written beautifully. Is that right? That's right. Um, you don't have to write them yourself because you know, it, it's fun to be able to write and you can have, a, you know, you write five different, oh yeah, <laughs> that particular one I wrote five times before I could figure out exactly the balance of what, how I wanted the letter to go. But um, let's say that you're not a good writer and let's say that you don't like dealing with ink and you're, and you're in a big rush and maybe you're in Kyoto and all your stuff is back in Tokyo. If you go to a uh, paper shop, especially in Kyoto, actually it's a thing that they do here in Tokyo, but people have forgotten that they do this, is that they'll have a calligrapher on hand. This is someone who's hired over there because of their beautiful handwriting. And you tell them where you're going to go. you will be like, look, I have to go to a chatty. Um, and you can buy, there's, you you give them a gift. Uh, you know, like if you go to someone's house and you um, bring a bottle of wine, well, if you go to a chatty, you'll, um, you'll bring them a gift of usually money. And it's a certain amount of money too. It's not like a huge amount, kind of depends on, you know, what the level of chaji is and who you're going to talk to and blah, blah, blah. But um, besides that, you just go to the the paper shop and you tell them, I'm going to a chaji, um, I need someone to write the envelope. And so they'll say, okay, well, who, from who to who, how much you're going to donate to them. And then they will write all this beautiful calligraphy on the top of the envelope and the inner envelope too, which tells you exactly how much is inside of the envelope. And um, they'll do it usually without a charge. Sometimes it's a charge of like, what, 500 yen or something like that. But, um, it's never expensive. It's great if, in case, you know, when I first started studying tea, I did not have nice handwriting. So um, I just could leave it to them. And um, it was, it's perfectly acceptable to pin that in. And it's so beautiful. It's like entertainment when you go and you watch somebody who is so oh, yeah. good at writing. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a wonderful thing to watch. I love it. <laughs> Very inspirational, too. It makes you want to go home and actually practice your chat really hard. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you are studying calligraphy, right? Japanese shodo? Yeah. And it's, I do it very formally every other week on Wednesday. I have to go. And it was the, uh, I was, I'm very fortunate to be able to study under the um, calligrapher to the emperor. So um, he's a very, very high uh, level uh, calligrapher, probably the best in the country. Um, he's a very, very nice old dude. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so wonderful to be able to watch him do it. So the, watch somebody else who is an extremely high level calligrapher makes you want to study and makes you very appreciative of that time that he is spending to show you how to hold the brush and show you how to, um, what kind of motions you need in order to be able to write them. And it's not just the calligraphy itself. It's also um, learning how to write these things helps you to learn how to read them. 
So if you go to a tea ceremony or if you go to someone's house and they have a kakejiku, which is a, a scroll, which is some kind of calligraphy written on the back of it, it's really hard to read those things, generally speaking. But if you're studying the, the calligraphy and the shodo, then you learn how to follow the, um, follow the strokes, and then you can figure out what they're trying to say. Not all the time, but a lot. <laughs> yeah. One other thing I wanted to end with, we've got five more minutes, um, is to talk about your trip to Ueno, Shitamachi. It's so beautiful. And of course, now we're having more rainy days. It's beautiful to see the lotus um, blossoms and all the lily pads and probably koi underneath and the beautiful pagoda beyond. Tell us about this place. Oh, this is this is Ueno Park. So uh, if you ever have a moment to go to Tokyo, visit Ueno Park. It has a very interesting history. It used to be hunting ground and then during, um, uh, right after uh, World War II, then everything was burned down and everybody moved into the park. So it became home for a lot of people for a good 10 years or so before everyone moved back and they could find their own homes again. But um, that location is now filled with lilies and lily pads everywhere. And there's a whole bunch of museums, which is the reason I went there initially is uh, to go see one of the museums nearby that location. But right now during Tsuyu, during the rainy season, I took this while it was raining outside and it's just absolutely gorgeous. So, you know, it's rainy and it's muggy and it's hot, but this season in itself has things that you could never see any other time. So it's worth going uh, going to different parts of the country, including Tokyo and Ueno and Kyoto, and seeing things that otherwise people miss because they all go during the hot summer season or the or the autumn. So that's right. Another there's, beautiful element to this one. Yeah, there's definitely things to enjoy about the cooler rainy season before the hot hot summer starts, um, but also taking in all of the green lush areas even around Tokyo so that you can feel cooler. I love that you're always introducing these lovely places. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of hoping that people will want to go see them themselves, you know, and it's right in front of you. So there's just so much beauty around the city and around the entire country. So, um, you know, I don't have a lot of pictures of, uh, you know, of the touristy kind of stuff so much, but just the things that you have, um, that you see in your everyday life. Like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, that's pretty. Um, just keep your eyes open, looking around you and seeing these amazing scenes that one day you're going to be able to remember, you know, you'll be 90 years old and sitting in your kotatsu and you'll be like, oh, I remember doing that way a long time ago. Wish I could go again. You know, you never will, of course, but those memories could be all you have. So it's the little things that are most important. That's wonderful. Um, you always suggest if people are interested in learning more about uh, Japanese culture or kimono culture, tea ceremony, um, that it's not a bad idea to sign up for a tea ceremony class and you can learn so many things. Is that right? I want to definitely say that tea, um, it's, we could think of it as the core of Japanese culture. So if you want to do shodo and calligraphy, and if you want to use kimono on a daily basis, if you want to use music, if you want to learn about sweets, if you want to learn about history, it's all contained in the tea ceremony. So um, yes, the, the first initial classes are always kind of complicated because the people are like, well, why do I have to hold the tea bowl in this particular way? But it's not about those things. It's about something um, which is will be deeper and more uh, easier to understand the more you do it. And it's not kind of like, I'm not talking about something esoteric. I'm talking very tangible there. So the beauty and the balance of Japanese um, aestheticism and what kind of materials each one of those tea items are made out of and what flower you're using for that particular day and um, kado and all that other things that you're doing, which are part of Japanese culture. This is all contained in tea. So if you don't know where to start, start with tea. And then if you're, then you can branch out to other things too. And you'll get the entire, uh, the whole world of it contained in that bowl of tea. I love that because it's not just about making tea. It's about observing the Japanese traditional scroll, which is hanging in the room. It's about understanding about ikebana, Japanese flower arrangement. It's about the style of the rush mat, the tatami. It's about how to whisk the tea in a certain way, right? It's There's so many elements. It's, it's actually connected to so much Japanese culture I had not realized before I talked to you. So thank you so much for introducing that. No, definitely do get into tea. Just start a little bit and then you'll see how much fun it can be. And, um, 
what what uh, level you can enjoy Japanese culture. In. Yeah, wonderful. And do you still enjoy drinking matcha when you go out to cafes and stuff? Do you choose it or sometimes coffee? Um, I, I'll be honest in that one. If I'm at a coffee shop, I usually drink coffee. Um, but if they happen to have a matcha, uh, a matcha option, then I tend to give the matcha sometimes too. It really depends where I am. But you know, just just to leave matcha. leave on a, a last note about coffee because <laughs> coffee culture is really a great part of Japanese culture as well. So even though the traditional is tea, I think there are so many wonderful coffee shops, and you introduced oh, this yeah. great one, Saru Tahiko, is it in Tokyo? That's right. Um, so Sarita Hiko Coffee is a very, um, it started about, about 10 years ago, I think, um, in Ebisu. It's the, the name Sarita Hiko comes from a Jinja, which is over by uh, an Inia can, I think. Actually, that's where the people who uh, started it came from. But um, what's interesting about the coffee culture here is just, just like every single country in the world, they have their own way that they developed coffee and coffee beans. But de Japan as well, they took to coffee the same way that they did for tea. So when it originally came from China and then over here, they developed into their own tea ceremony and now into this wonderful culture, which is uniquely Japanese. Well, similarly, coffee too is now on that stage where people, they brought in the coffee, well, what the hell is this? And then they slowly developed it into their own sort of coffee dole in a sense in the way that their their coffee the study of coffee and the way that they drink it the way that it's um, produced the way that it's everything about it it's designed to be something which is relatively uniquely japanese so the coffee you'll get here over in japan is going to be different than the coffee you might be used to in your own home country and um, that's a new uh, element of the culture which is slowly developing and we can watch this developing um, during our lifetimes too so it's really kind of cool I love that. So I love that you tell us about the versatility and openness of kimono culture, as well as tea culture, as well as coffee culture. So I think if people are visiting Japan or living in Japan, these are very, uh, very high quality experiences, but you don't have to feel inhibited about trying it out or entering. Is that right? Oh yeah, this is something that everybody can see on their daily life. It's just a matter of um, just looking for it. It's just right there in front of you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ricky, for your thank wonderful you. insights and good luck with all of your, your film production in Fukushima. I hope you have some nice weather. Thank you very much. We've been lucky so far and it hasn't rained even though it was supposed to be raining, which is a good thing. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I hope that continues. I look forward to following your Twitter. If anybody wants to follow more insights, wonderful daily insights, usually on Twitter, have a look at paprika girl underscore JP on Twitter. And uh, there's links from there to your website and Instagram as well. Same handle, right? Yep. Um, I very rarely on Instagram, maybe once a month, maybe. Um, I just, for the interaction, you can talk to people on Twitter and I really like that. So. Yeah. Well, you have a great following and it's such a great it's engagement. So, so many people really appreciate, like me, really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're talking with Violet. She's based in Kochi in Shikoku Island, and she's doing a lot of innovative and interesting things in kind of a rural area of Japan. So that'll be an interesting talk tomorrow. Same time, 9 a.m. Thank you so much, Riki. Thank you, everybody, for Thank joining. You. Have a good day. Bye-bye.